Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I guess we'll just wait for the other panelists to get their webcam on. Um, today's topic is about today's students um, and how to what um, practices and student success you can do to support them. Um, so I guess we can start by going around and everyone can introduce who they are and where they're from. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Balkwest. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of Higher Learning Advocates. Hi everyone, this is Erica Cuevas. I'm a Senior Policy Manager at Jobs for the Future and I'm tuning in from Northern Virginia. And hi, my name is Kyle Southern. I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director for Higher Education at Young Invincibles. And I welcome you to my home here in Washington, DC. And I'm Madeline St. Amour, a reporter at Inside Higher Ed, um, and I cover today's students or non-traditional students as my beat. Um, so I guess, you know, to start us off today, we can start with the basic question of who are today's students? Um, I don't know if all of you want to kind of touch on that and what your definition is of today's students or if one of you wants to pick that up. Yeah, I actually wrote down some stats. So um, one of my favorite things to do is um, recite them, but um, I'm sure a lot of the folks listening um, know this because we work with these students, but um, nationally, 37% of students are older than 25 years old, 64% work, 24% are parenting, 40% attend part-time, 49% are financially independent, which some people think is like, yeah, good thing, I'm financially independent, but it means that they're on their own financially. Um, and 31% are at or below the federal poverty line. So Erica, Kyle, anything to add? Yeah, thanks, Emily, for kicking that off. I would just add that today's students in post-secondary education are, like Emily had highlighted, um, a lot more diverse than past generations, and they come to post-secondary education with complex needs and interests um, that are different than past generations. And so from JFF's perspective, we really do see today's students also being uh, individuals who are in any form of post-secondary education um, learning, that includes work-based learning, includes apprenticeships, it's not just students who are in the traditional semester-based sort of environments, but other uh, students as well who are getting additional training to ultimately enter into the workforce and to be successful. I would just add a couple of points. Um, one, this gets to the demographics of the population, uh, but and we'll talk about this a lot more during the session, but I think it really um, elevates the concern and the growing agenda around meeting students' basic needs. So especially in this um, current moment, as we see um, more and more students struggling with housing security, food insecurity, um, transportation, access to reliable internet, um, those sorts of issues I think are particularly um, relevant for today's student population. Um, I'd also mention uh, a couple of other um, uh, populations that are uh, continue to be underserved. Uh, those are our students who are uh, incarcerated and not eligible for uh, Pell uh, access and, and Pell grants uh, since the 1994 crime bill. Uh, for our students who are um, on DACA or undocumented or come from mixed status families, which can also have a direct impact on their access to um, aid and to higher education. Uh, and we've already mentioned our uh, adult learners. So how we can be nimble and think about um, these populations is also really important for uh, this conversation. Um, and what do you see today's students, you know, all those groups that you just mentioned, what are their biggest needs? Are there certain things that stick out? Is it mostly just financial need or are there additional things that you see these students um, not getting to, to be able to succeed? Yeah, I'm happy to start. We're seeing that today's students need robust supports in order to help them be successful in post-secondary education. So their needs include not only just flexible financial aid, but also access to services such as housing, transportation, food, childcare, for example, the ability to be able to work part or full time while also attending courses. So ensuring that their course load is also flexible. So 
essentially what state students need are robust wraparound supports. Um, and that continues today and is even more so um, the case in today's environment and the, the situation we're all finding ourselves in um, given the, the coronavirus pandemic. I would just add there are good examples uh, of that, particularly if you look at the City University of New York, um, their ASAP model, I think, has um, doubled effectively the graduation rates for many of the student populations we've talked about in terms of not only providing tuition assistance, but also really intensive uh, academic advising and mentoring support uh, for students, as well as access to, um, in New York, to public transportation and having uh, a way for people to get to campus uh, and back has been really important. So I want to stress that it's not just the uh, tuition relief, but also that relationship building, um, that advising component has been really important. Uh, we've seen some limited replication of, of that model. I know in, in Nashville, Tennessee, there's a program called Nashville Grad that's attempting to sort of emulate um, the CUNY ASAP model in a very different um, environment. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. You can contrast that with a program like um, New York State's Excelsior, a program which has a lot of different uh, requirements uh, for not just getting um, tuition aid but also maintaining it from year to year that we've seen uh, even just in, in new data I think it came out maybe today or, or yesterday about the very low levels of community college students accessing um, that uh, quote-unquote free tuition uh, benefit uh, it's just proven by the program designed to not be uh, facilitated for our community college students and for many of uh, the folks in today's students population. So I just want to stress how policy design is really important in thinking about how we serve these populations. Did you want to add anything, Emily? Yeah, I'll just quickly add, um, you know, I think we touched a little bit on um, robust supports, including things like emergency aid, which are um, particularly heightened and relevant in this time. Um, also open textbooks, um, some of the kind of more bite-sized policy recommendations that um, aren't the most flashy or often talked about, but would really have big impact for today's students. Um, again, talking about different pathways to and through education, we know that um, individuals don't just enter and exit post-secondary education once anymore. Um, they're likely to change jobs more often. Um, and you know the financial aid rules that we're working under right now under the Higher Education Act were last rewritten in 2008. Um, today's students looked very differently um, three weeks ago and even more different now. Um, and so we need to work to update federal policy to better fit their needs. Um, I know a lot of this work is being uh, done by through like the Today's Student Coalition that you're most of your organizations are a part of. So would you want to talk about why your organizations chose to join the coalition and what work you're doing within that? Yeah, so I'm happy to kick that off. Um, the Today Students Coalition um, launched in August of last year. We're really thankful to NASPA for being a member along with JFF and Young Invincibles. Um, where we now have 20 organizations who have joined the Today Students Coalition. Um, coming together around all of the needs of different groups of students. We have folks who are experts on student veterans, um, experts on online learning, um, experts on basic needs, um, so many different, um, different veins of student populations have banded together under the Today Students Coalition umbrella um, to come up with and really rally around bipartisan policy solutions and shared advocacy actions. Erica or Kyle? Yeah, happy to talk a little bit more about why JFF decided to join the Today Students Coalition. We are one of the steering committee members and are very happy to be a part of the group. Um, so first, just a little bit more about JFF. We are a national nonprofit organization that drives systems change across our nation's education and workforce systems. So we work in, I believe now it's 40 to 45 different states across the country and we're working with systems, community colleges, state agencies, schools, school districts on helping them improve and transform how they deliver education and training to, to today's students. And so one of the reasons why we were really happy to see the Today's Students Coalition formed and why we're a part of the group is because in our policy and advocacy work, we have been seeing a continued need to inform policymakers 
on the demographics of today's students and really breaking down misperceptions about who they are. So as mentioned earlier, they're no longer what we typically hear and what folks typically refer to as students who are in high school and they're going directly from high school into college or post-secondary education, but they're older, like we mentioned before, they're student parents, they have complex needs. And so we see a continued need to update policymakers in regards to who today's students are, the challenges that they face, and why there needs to be important policy updates to best serve today's students. And the more we can elevate uh, student voices in those conversations, we believe um, will help ultimately uh, result in good policy that ultimately achieves the intended impact that we want to see in communities and in, in regions. And uh, from my perspective, I'm with Young Invincibles. We're about a 10 year old organization um, founded in the context of the 2009-10 debate over the Affordable Care Act. I have a recognition that um, young people's voices were largely not being heard um, in that debate. And so uh, from that, we've evolved into a national organization, um, mainly focused on federal policy uh, here in DC as it affects access and affordability for healthcare and for higher education for uh, young adults age 18 to 34 is our primary um, target demographic. Um, we've been uh, deeply involved in conversations around college affordability um, for about uh, five or six years now. Um, and that, I think, reflects both our recognition of the student debt crisis that really arose from state disinvestment following the Great Recession and the effect that that's had on the economic uh, stability of the millennial generation and um, depending on how the next uh, couple of years go on the rising generation uh, as well. So we're doggedly committed to uh, a better economic future for uh, young adults and to also have them more fully engaged in the democratic process um, and to participate in voting. So we know that uh, if people have diminished economic prospects, they're less likely to engage in a variety of uh, positive civic behaviors. And so we really exist to one, promote um, that economic uh, stability for people so that they can uh, have the kind of lives that they can be um, contributing members to their society, uh, as well as participate in our elections and have the education they need to prepare for um, good family wage jobs uh, down the line. Thanks. Um, so now to kind of delve into the topic that's at the top of everyone's mind right now, um, you know, the coronavirus pandemic, how is that impacting today's students? What are you guys seeing? What are you hearing? Um, you know, how is this playing out for the most vulnerable students? Yeah, I'm happy I'll, to jump I'll in. We have, oh, um, okay. we have a set of uh, young adult advisory uh, boards around the country uh, in five states with regional offices. And so we've been talking with our uh, young people um, over the last couple of weeks, uh, our current college students, recent graduates, about what their experiences are. Uh, I think the, the primary um, word from them is uncertainty. You know, they hear a lot of news, much of it conflicting um, from D.C., from their state leaders, from their local leaders. Can I go outside? Can I not? Um, that, that basic uh, kind of question. But also, we just passed a $2 trillion um, bill here. Um, that's the largest investment in uh, the economy, uh, arguably, in history. And they know that there's some provisions about higher education in there. And I think we'll talk about those more a little bit later. But I think that that uncertainty is driving a lot of uh, angst as much as um, the evident public health crisis that we have. And so for a lot of our students who are already um, economically or educationally marginalized, um, to feel that added anxiety of not being sure about their economic futures, whether it's about um, their student debts or their wages and job security, um, those are really exacerbating a lot of the mental health challenges that many people face, as well as physical health challenges that, that come from it. So that uncertainty and angst, both from uh, a kind of basic health perspective, as well as, as well as a, how do these new big policies uh, potentially affect me and my life and my family, um, those are the main things that we're hearing from students and uh, the 
kind of last point I'll make because I mentioned the uh, incarcerated student population earlier as well. That's a population that needs a lot um, of advocacy because um, we've got a population of people who are in facilities that are almost perfectly designed to communicate disease. And so without a real uh, elevated conversation and advocacy for those most marginalized students, um, there's some um, really catastrophic potential uh, in those facilities um, for, for all of our two million people who are incarcerated, but also including our, our thousands of uh, students who are uh, behind those walls. So I just wanted to mention them as well. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Happy to jump into and add some additional thoughts. So I think that's all right in terms of there's a lot of confusion, anxiety, um, pressure right now that students are feeling on campus or um, not necessarily on campus right now. I think we're seeing many campuses and universities across the country close and that has resulted in additional sort of challenges in terms of today's students for many of those who relied on college campuses as a safe place to be, as a place that provided housing, food, even an on-campus job. And so now today's students are facing an additional layer of challenges when their campuses are being closed and they're not able to go there physically. Um, so that's a lot of what we've been hearing in terms of what, how the current environment and the coronavirus pandemic is, is impacting today's students um, even more so than than the challenges they were facing before. Emily, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think that's all um, exactly right. And um, especially thinking of the graduating seniors who no longer have commencement ceremonies and um, had something to look forward to and now just have so much uncertainty. Um, and also the student parents who are you know, studying and also trying to help their kids now study or teaching them. Um, and without, you know, regular child care options or any, um, you know, just these increased challenges that um, are kind of in the face of a student population that already faced many more challenges than students in the past. Yeah, and I will add one last thing that I didn't touch on before, but the, the challenge of access to technology and internet as well, we're seeing and hearing um, that come up in our various networks. So when we think about rural students in particular, not having access to maybe internet or even the, just the devices to get online. So computers, tablets, et cetera. So um, we're seeing sort of some inequalities that existed before being even more exasperated at, at this time. Yeah, but definitely. Um, so to the kind of solution end of this, what do you think policy leaders and institutional leaders um, should be doing to respond to the coronavirus in a way that helps today's students and doesn't just put up more barriers for them? I think it might be helpful if we talk a little bit about um, what policymakers have recently done. Um, I think we all you know, have certain parts of the bill that we are paying close attention to, but as Kyle mentioned, um, this latest package, the third package called the CARES Act, um, included a lot of higher education provisions, um, including a, a state education stabilization fund, um, things like emergency aid, both the allowable use of existing funds for emergency aid and new funds directed toward emergency aid, um, flexibility in some financial aid rules, including satisfactory academic progress, the Pell lifetime eligibility limits and loan limits, um, continuing federal work study payments for today's students, um, and some of the loan flexibility provisions, which I'll let um, other folks talk about too. Yeah, that'd be great. If you guys wanted to touch on what was in that bill, um, you know, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you thought is, what you think is going to be helpful. Yeah, from JFFs and we, liked all of the items that Emily just mentioned, and we appreciated how with this third stimulus package, there was a focus on today's students and, to, and workers. And we're hoping that for any additional relief packages that are introduced moving forward, that there is conti there continues to be a focus on students. Uh, just one addition would be, we were happy to see additional funding going into the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, so SNAP. Many of today's students qualify for SNAP um, and rely on that as uh, a source of support. And so we were happy to see that that was 
uh, focused on in this latest package. Um, I'll just I'll just pick up on uh, Emily's point about the um, emergency grant provisions that were in the CARES Act. Um, within about a thirty billion dollar uh, provision for higher education, there's fourteen uh, billion dollars to go to institutions for basically emergency assistance. Um, at least half of those dollars need to be allocated for student level emergency grants. So the other half can be used by the institutions themselves to address revenue shortfalls or the process of getting technology for students or a host of other things that are most critical for them. Uh, but it's an important provision. And uh, I think um, Senator Patty Murray and um, Representative Scott on the House side deserve a lot of credit for elevating the basic uh, needs uh, of today's students and getting that $7 billion provision um, into the bill. Um, that can be used for students who have the kind of needs that we've been talking about with us around housing, access to food, childcare, healthcare, technology. Um, and so I think it's important for uh, all of us to think about what are equitable ways for that money to be distributed. Um, there's not a ton of guidance in the law about um, how the funds can be uh, designed and, and um, distributed to students. So that's going to come down to institutional leadership, system leadership. There's some guidance from places like um, the Hope Center at Temple University on best practices for emergency uh, grant uh, distribution. Um, how widespread knowledge is of those guidelines, uh, I don't know, frankly. But I think that it will come down to folks on campuses um, to think about what are the best ways to do this in an efficient way um, that gets the most assistance to the students who need it most. And just to add quickly, I think the um, the nimbleness that this emergency aid provision allows um, is one of its greatest strengths. Um, I've seen stories of students who have needs that I could have never imagined, like um, you know, their campus closed, so they needed to rent storage facilities for their things. Um, they may have needed to rent a car to get back home or um, emergency transportation, um, a security deposit for a new place to live. I mean, um, these are really unprecedented times and something that policymakers haven't been able to anticipate. And so really glad to see um, the um, maximum amount of flexibility in there. Um, for the, the ones who are closest to the students to design the funds and to disseminate those funds in the way that's best for students. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think it moving forward, there needs to be a close eye towards looking at how the provisions are being implemented and to do that continuous learning as to what is working, what is not working, what are some of these needs and challenges that students are facing that maybe weren't addressed in the third stimulus bill but could be in future bills moving forward so i think there's a lot of uncertainty right now um, and unknown but um, something that we're keeping an eye out for i'd add one thing in terms of what um, was left out was the disappointment from uh, our perspective um, you may have heard uh, for folks with student debt um, there's a six month suspension in repayment uh, as well as uh, involuntary collection. So wage garnishment or, or taking money from tax returns or other public benefits to pay loans that are in default. So while those are um, folks who are probably out of school or recently out of school, um, it does have a, a direct impact uh, on a lot of families, a lot of young people uh, and the way the, the program was designed uh, for loan suspension. It doesn't uh, apply to those with private loans um, and some older federal loans, so at least about 9 million people uh, out. It's also very possible that some people are carrying loan debts from prior enrollment and are current students. So I think in the in the next round of legislation, um, something that we would uh, want to think about and advocate for is how can we fill those gaps, um, knowing that, yes, in six months, people are going to pick up that sort of heavy uh, debt burden and, and keep carrying it forward. So from our perspective, we would love to see some more affirmative uh, loan debt cancellation and, and more direct relief uh, for people. But if Congress can't go that far, the least they can do is apply um, that same principle of suspending repayment um, for everyone, regardless of who's uh, backing or servicing their loan. 
Yeah, I had heard that criticism a lot. Um, and I know there were a few others going around in higher ed circles. Is there anything else that you wish had been included or would be included in future bills, Erica or Emily? Um, I think there are a couple like very specific things um, in regards to the way that students interact with the federal stimulus checks are being called. Um, independent students um, who did not file taxes in fiscal year 2018 do not qualify for that check. Um, dependent students who are over the age of 17, you know, still being claimed on their parents' taxes. Um, no one receives payments for them, their parent or themselves. Um, and so thinking through those two things, I also think we're going to really have to figure out as a community what high quality distance education looks like. Um, I think, you know, obviously the Department of Education grants the waiver. Um, simultaneously, we're going through the proposed rulemaking for distance education as a result of the negotiated rulemaking last year. Um, it'll be interesting to see how those two things interact. Um, and I think it's really important for policymakers and advocates to speak up about what high quality means in this environment. Um, I also think we're going to have to figure out what basic needs means. Um, things like cost of attendance um, and how that shifts when you're thinking about childcare and housing and transportation. And um, also, um, the last point is um, in our last economic downturn, we saw a huge influx of adult students returning to higher education. Um, something I noticed that was very specific, but in the state education stabilization fund, the money that was allocated to states is based on a formula um, for individuals ages six through 24. When we know that almost 40% of students are older than 25. Um, so not only should we think about that in future packages and accounting for that, but we need to focus on policies and make it easier for adult students to either enter college for the first time or return with some credit, no credential, and get them through to complete their credential. So that's things like supports and completion strategies um, and some changes to the financial aid rules. Yeah, that's right. I would just echo the need for in future, future packages to focus on additional supports and funding for technology and distance learning. Um, we at JFF also want to see some efforts moving forward, maybe not in the fourth stimulus package, but if there is one after that, some effort made by federal policymakers in terms of modernization efforts, um, really recognizing that before the coronavirus pandemic, there were a lot of and there have been a lot of outdated practices and systems in place across higher education. So how can we use this also as a time to update and modernize a lot of how we, as a nation, deliver higher education um, and ensure that the system can be agile, resilient, and um, flexible to meet these sort of challenges again in the future if they do arise? Yeah, that, that's a great point. I just to kind of, I think, fill in a kind of a middle space from uh, both Eric and Emily's points. You know, I think, um, at least from my perspective, um, Emily referenced the fact that the Higher Education Act has not been updated um, since the, before the last Great Recession. And so we're moving into this economic downturn with policies for higher ed that were built on perceptions of students from the earliest years of this century that just don't line up with where we are. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, a political reality that we're going to start facing as we weather this public health crisis uh, and the political realities of a November election. Um, I think it's, uh, although we've had a comprehensive rewrite of the HEA bill, it becomes very tough to see how something um, that big can move through uh, this Congress with this um, emergency response mode. And if we're going to have a series more of, of uh, big legislation to address the basic uh, you know, livelihoods of people, it's going to be tough to move anything. So um, to Erica's point, I think it behooves us to think about what are the um, levers for making some progress for better supporting our students um, through these vehicles in a way that we would have advocated for six weeks ago, through maybe through HEA reauthorization. But what are some things that we know will address real needs? And um, just as a, a closing point, um, we have to be clear about the fact that whenever students return to campuses or uh, however they're re-enrolled, um, the, the mental health challenges that a lot of people are going to have based on the trauma of 
what's happening and what's going to happen. And if you look at the projections of um, what we can expect in terms of uh, lost life as a result of this um, disease, it's going to affect so many people. And a lot of them are going to be uh, current students, people who were planning to enroll this fall. Um, so are we going to finally have sort of a, a Marshall Plan or a large scale initiative around better supporting the mental health of our uh, current students, regardless of their background? That's a really important question and something that I think uh, is going to be um, something that we just have to address for this generation of students because it's going to um, affect uh, their personal lives as well as their academic trajectories. Mm -hmm. um, before we move on to the next question in the list, we do have a quick question from someone in the audience asking, um, does the six month hold include interest accrual as well um, for the student loan? piece. Um, so it's, does someone want to answer that question quickly? Uh, the quick answer is yes. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, those, those, those uh, interest payments are, are put on hold for that six months. Um, I, it should also be noted that if you're in public service loan forgiveness, um, there's a lot of concern that if um, People just didn't have to pay for six months that could throw off their timeline. Um, that's, those are folks who are in nonprofit or public service fields who go into a 10 year repayment uh, plan. And, have, and as long as they make 120 consecutive payments, the outstanding loan balances are forgiven. Um, these six months will count uh, as paid for the purposes of PSLF. So that won't extend uh, the time period for those folks to. Um, have the rest of their loan balances uh, forgiven. So kind of the overall message here was to kind of, I guess, hold harmless uh, those folks for six months um, uh, through this bill. But the quick answer is yes. Thank you. Um, so I guess looking forward, you know, what do you think the long-term implications are for what people, you know, policymakers and leaders choose to do today? You know, how could this how could what's happening now with the coronavirus and the response to it impact today's students down the line? Anyone want to start off? Yeah, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, in terms of institutional leaders um, and college leaders, I think what we've been seeing in the near term and in as of recently is there being a lot of focus on addressing the immediate crisis of ensuring students are safe, faculty and staff are all safe, of ensuring that there's a transition to online learning, um, looking at how the institution itself can really weather this uh, coronavirus and thinking about finances, et cetera. And those are all good priorities to focus on now. From JFS perspective, what we do think in the near term is that institutional leaders, particularly those at public two-year colleges and public universities are going to have to make a pivot here pretty soon and also look towards long-term planning of what do they need to do now, how, what tr transitions do they need to, need to make now to best support students by the time by the time this um, coronavirus pandemic is over. So we know projections are showing that by, by the time the pandemic virus is over, that we'll be likely in a recession. And like Emily mentioned, many folks go back to higher education um, during recessions to get additional education and to get training because they, they need that um, in order to access jobs. And we know folks are gonna wanna get to work right away. So there are gonna need to be some adjustments that institutional leaders need to think about and make right now to, to meet those needs then. Um, that could be, you know, rethinking how they deliver education. So by the time we're out of the, you know, past the coronavirus pandemic, many students will have some form of online learning possibly under their belts. Are they going to expect that as well um, in future semesters or in, in future courses? Are they going to expect more hybrid models? Um, of some mixture of being in person versus online. So that's one piece. I think we're gonna wanna see institutional leaders also think about how they can continue to partner with workforce and employers in their area to ensure that education and training is going to be aligned with the jobs that are gonna be offered at that time. Um, and as mentioned earlier, in regards to the needs of today's students, and this will remain the same, in the future, students are going to need to work 
while attending classes. So they're gonna have to do both. And so how can we ensure that the experiences that they're receiving are high quality, um, that they're related to work-based learning opportunities, that they're able to, to work in areas of their field of study to get that hands-on experience while also attending courses. So really thinking about either strengthening relationships between institutions and employers, or if those aren't already in place, how can, can institutional leaders begin that process now? Tyler, Emily, would you want to add to that? Um, yeah, it's, um, I wish I had a crystal ball to see um, what's going to happen. I do think Erica is right, and that's, um, probably more likely to have more students um, accessing or wanting to access online courses and training. Um, I already think before the coronavirus pandemic that the notion that individuals had um, four years full time to spend learning um, was a myth. Um, I think after this and in the economic downturn that we're gonna see, um, both policymakers will need to think through and institutions will need to act on how um, how we can be more nimble, how we can be more fast in getting students um, return on investment and a value in a program that is directly tied to our workforce needs. Um, I think that, you know, we'll see policymakers step up to prioritize that. It's been a conversation that we've been um, flirting around in higher education for a long time, I think. Um, I think that conversation is going to become heightened um, in the new reality with our new economic environment. Um, those are all great points. I, I just had uh, a couple of things that I was thinking about from Erica and, and Emily's um, comments. Um, the, the first is I think uh, when we do move through this that um, we'll see an acceleration in the breakdown of some of the traditional divides that we've seen um, in education, whether that's from high school to community college to four year, um, I think you'll see uh, an increasing uh, sort of collapsing of, of those walls, which I think ultimately may actually benefit um, students in terms of accelerating their pathways uh, through education and, and hopefully into um, a better job and economic uh, reality than the one that we have now or the one that came out from the last recession. The time will tell on that. A great challenge is that I think we'll be forced at a systems level to do that um, in yet another era of sort of quote unquote doing more with less. And a real risk that we have is to repeat the um, failures of disinvestment in our higher education systems uh, from the past, uh, which passes even more of the cost of, of higher ed um, onto students and families, uh, making it even more inaccessible. So I think from an advocacy perspective, something that, that we'll be working on a lot, particularly at the state level, um, is to um, hopefully reinvigorate a conversation around the public good mission of higher education um, and of education in general. And I think that there's a lot of learning that needs to take place still um, to have uh, what I sometimes call bilingual folks across K-12 and higher education, because we often are talking in different languages. And so how we can better uh, understand um, our systemic barriers uh, across uh, a student's educational pathway, whether they're traditional age or, or a returning learner um, or a student parent. Um, I think that the, the sort of retrenchment or uh, the the lower levels of investment that we'll see from legislatures is going to force those conversations in many ways. So while we shouldn't just accept that as a new normal, um, we should also think about, um, you know, we often are in the business uh, conversation around disruption of their of their models. We've already got, we've got an external disruptive event, and so job one is take care of yourself, take care of each other. Um, and, and move through this. On the other side, um, how do we think about this disruptive event as uh, a way to, to Erica's point earlier, um, think about ways we can hopefully promote more equitable practices and policies uh, for our students, um, regardless of their background. Mm -hmm. Sort of going off of that, when we think about the recession that some say has started already, that's 
undoubtedly going to start soon. Um, do you, how do you see that playing out? Because it's going to have high unemployment, most likely that's what the projections are, um, but we're already seeing states tighten their belts, we're already seeing uh, universities and colleges tightening their belts, hiring freezes and pay cuts and things like that. So, and we are seeing that people are being forced off of campus or away from their classrooms. And so do you think that kind of all these things combined with the unique aspects of the coronavirus and the social distancing is going to affect retention in a negative way? Do you think this recession is going to be the same as it has been before where there's an influx or do you think that people aren't going to turn to higher education this time? That's for anyone. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, and like Emily mentioned earlier, I wish I had a crystal ball and could see into the future to know exactly how it's gonna play out. But I, I'm i inclined to say that, you know, when or if a recession comes, there will be an influx in enrollment at open access institutions. So thinking about community colleges, we as a society continue to value higher education, um, credentials and degrees in, in terms of employer practices and hiring. So I think folks will be inclined to move in that direction. And, and if they don't already have a credential or degree, maybe they'll think about going and getting one in order to get a good job moving forward in the economy. Um, I do think there is a small window right now to ensure that we don't lose students who are currently enrolled because of this crisis. Um, they need those additional supports, they need flexibility, they need emergency assistance. Um, so I know there are institutions out there working really hard to make sure that they're, they don't lose students along this, this journey that hopefully won't be too long. Um, but yeah, I'm inclined to say I think there will be increased enrollment. And, and that said, institutions, particularly these open access community college institutions, will need additional support to meet that sort of influx of of more students at their door needing help so they're going to need additional financial supports um and and the abilities to sort of adapt and be agile to the to the moment in time yeah i'll quickly add um i think i saw today or yesterday that there has been a recent decline in um individuals completing the fafsa um i I don't think that's not willingness to enroll or to persist um, and to attend an institution next year. I think um, things like prior prior year are going to be um, a lot more complicated moving forward and may not, may not make sense for a lot of individuals. And so um, things like the professional judgment um, and financial aid appeals, um, I think are gonna be a lot more important in um, helping students regardless of age um, especially older who have dependents and um, may have lost their job or on unemployment and don't know how to complete the FAFSA anymore um, and helping them complete that that form and hopefully re-enroll again just to just to pick up on that um, I agree about the the effects of increased enrollment um, particularly at our community colleges but I'm also mindful that, um, you know, Erica pointed out rightly that we, as a society, value uh, sort of credentialism, um, but we haven't valued our community colleges nearly enough. And so I'm I'm concerned about uh, a repeat of increased enrollment at institutions that, um, in terms of a public funding perspective, are often um, equipped with the least capacity to ensure their eventual success. And that can lead to uh, a, re a repeated cycle of students coming in, uh, in many cases obtaining student debt, leaving with no degree, and now you're in the worst possible situation, which is you, you've exacerbated your debt burden, but you're uh, continuing to have limited uh, economic possibility uh, in the job market uh, because of for whatever reason, often from, uh, you know, a lot of students are about an uh, unexpected car repair or unexpected doctor's visit away from facing a real tough decision about whether they should stay enrolled uh, in school. And so how do we build a stronger net for those folks to continue on their pathway to completing their credentials is a really essential conversation for us to have 
Um, one good resource for folks too uh, in this conversation, although a little adjacent, um, our colleagues over at uh, the Education Trust back in December published a really revelatory report called the Affordability Gap, um, which looks at what are the number of hours someone would have to work in order to make up uh, the difference between their average age, pa age package and the cost of higher education. And what they systemically show, I think in a really novel way, is uh, basically someone would have to work uh, every waking hour when they're not in class to make up that affordability gap, even at their public flagship institution. That's at public schools. Um, I'm also mindful that you know, something that we've uh, addressed uh, explicitly in this conversation, but has to be part of our considerations going forward, is coming in, into this from uh, what I, I would call a racial justice perspective. You know, when you look at um, access and affordability and the way that higher education has been set up historically, uh, it's not designed uh, in a systemic way at a macro level to facilitate the success of many students of color. Um, and we also see a disproportionate share of the student debt burden being borne by borrowers of color, um, many of whom uh, come through uh, the very institutions that I just referenced with relatively low completion rates. So I think this is a, a moment, I think, for us to really take a step back and a cut check in terms of a economic and racial justice perspective on higher education, to think about what are the systemic inequities that we've allowed to perpetuate for decades. And so maybe the best way to uh, fix an engine is to stop it and go in and overhaul it. Um, so I don't want to you know, carry that too far down the line, but I, I can't stress enough um, that all of these conversations that we're having now, we're on the minds of people in 2008, 2009, 2010, and yet we've allowed this affordability crisis to rise over the last decade. And so I have deep concerns um, for low-income people and people of color in particular about what it's going to mean for their educational economic prospects going forward. And I would just close by pointing out that the last time that we raised the minimum wage was also about the time of that Great Recession. So we've still got a 725 uh, federal minimum wage and so if you're a student who's working in a part-time job, you're probably not making a great wage to make up that affordability gap. And so I think that we're just seeing, we're, we're paying, we're gonna have to pay penance um, for not taking care of our um, lower income and middle income people over the last decade in terms of uh, what it's gonna be their effects on their potential to get, yes, new credentials, but also to succeed in getting those credentials and to find better paying work on the other side. <laughs> Um, I just want to take a second to say that um, people can put in their questions in the chat box um, and then the NASPA organizers will be sending that to us so that I can ask the panelists any of your questions that you might have. Um, I do have uh, one to kind of fill the time. Uh, so Emily, you kind of mentioned how in a few, you all did really, how we might be moving toward using online learning more so by this, how it's kind of gonna push higher ed to finally start um, taking advantage of technology and what they can do with it. Um, how do you, what do you think institutions and policymakers need to be thinking about um, for today's students and in terms of, you know, making sure they have accessibility? I know that there's, I think there's some studies that show that the more vulnerable students tend to do worse in online classes than they do in person, even if it, is more convenient as step simply like it's still not as great for making connections with faculty and that sort of thing so how do you think that institutions could start thinking about how to fix those gaps emily want to start maybe yeah, or? Sure. um yeah i think just in the way that i'm trying to figure out how to have high quality check-ins with my coworkers and teammates um, that, you know, financial aid administrators and um, student advisors, professors um, will need to figure out how to facilitate those high quality interactions that they may not have had to do virtually, um, which certainly takes a different approach and a different component. Um, I don't think there's a one size fits all approach. And um, as, uh, thinking about open access institutions, having increasing enrollment, um, keeping up with some of those challenges and additional um, influx of students um, who need um, different supports um, than they did in the past, I think is going to be um, one of the pieces of the puzzle to figure out.
Yeah, I think for me, one area of concern is in regards to students who are and who may be um, not academically prepared in one or more subject areas who had they gone on campus, they may have received sort of more of that in-person direct support and assistance to help them move along and progress, but now are having to sort of engage fully online. And so what does that look like? How can we ensure that they don't far, fall farther behind, um, but still are able to progress in those classes where they may need additional support? Um, so that's a challenge definitely that needs to be grappled with. Um, and we need to, to learn from, uh, from those who are already engaging with that. Yeah, just, just two quick points, and this is um, kind of outside of my, my usual lane, so I certainly defer to the expertise of Erica and Emily, um, but just to, just to point out uh, one, um, I think the move to online learning in many ways has particular challenges for students with disabilities, and so I'm, I'm curious about the ability of um, disability services offices on campuses um, to work with their academic units to make sure that our students with disabilities continue to have high quality academic experiences uh, if they are online, um, what that'll look like. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure, but it's certainly a question that should be front of mind um, for many people. Um, and sorry to keep going back to the um, incarcerated student population, but it's a particular passion of mine. Um, Online education is in general not an option um, for those students. And so if we're in an environment where instruction can't be delivered in person, um, then often it's done not at all or by um, by correspondence, which harkens way back to a different time. Um, so if, if we're thinking about what successful reentry to the free world looks like for those students, um, it's gonna be very difficult to imagine a world doing that if we move to um, an increasingly online uh, environment when internet access uh, in general isn't uh, even an option for many of those students. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we do have a question from someone in the audience. What role do you think student unions and associations can play in assisting the coalition and advocating for themselves? Many student un unions often do this anyways, but has there been something we've but has this been something that you've heard student affairs professionals think of incorporating into their plans? Does anyone wanna take that up? Sure, so we're thrilled that the coalition has um, two student groups that have recently joined the Association of Big Ten Students and the Cornell Student Assembly. Um, as Erica mentioned um, earlier in our chat, um, incorporating students' perspectives into our policy agendas and uplifting their voices through advocacy actions is a core principle and goal of the Today's Students Coalition. Um, further, I was recently speaking to a group of students here in DC and um, one of them raised her hand and asked a question and said, well, if I wanna get involved with all the federal policy issues that you guys have been talking about today, where's a good place for me to do that? And others uh, before me responded, well, you can keep an eye on the Federal Register and you can read inside higher ed and the Chronicle and other higher education reporters. Um, and there, there wasn't a very student friendly answer to that. Um, that's certainly one of the reasons why the Today's Students Coalition exists and was formed and we're working on um, being that central resource for policymakers looking to um, incorporate today's students into their work. Um, and to advocate for them and to helping today's students become better advocates for themselves. Erica or Kyle, did you want to comment on that? I would just put in a plug um, for uh, Young Invincible, as I mentioned earlier, that we have a Young Advocates uh, program in uh, five of our regional states. That's a, a paid advocacy training, um, basically internship program uh, for uh, young adults who are either current college students or uh, recent alumni. Um, those students get the opportunity to uh, participate in advocacy days in their um, state legislatures. Um, we have intensive programming on kind of policy advocacy. Um, that's in New York, Illinois, Colorado, Texas, and California. Um, I should also mention that the California Student Assemblies are uh, incredibly effective, I think, at advocating for the needs of students uh, in their legislatures. Um, so if you're in other states, I think um, looking to 
um, the advocacy model that the um, CSU and UC student unions and their community college students have um, is uh, oftentimes inspiring and instructive for how a real effective student advocacy um, can go forward. So if, if you're in one of those um, five states I mentioned, um, feel free to, to contact the local um, Young Invincibles uh, office. We'd love to have that. And I would just close by saying, um, although I'm a person that deals in uh, numeric data a lot of the times, I'm mindful that a policymaker will often forget a data point you throw at them, but they rarely ever forget a really compelling story that someone shares uh, from their own experience. Um, so I think the more we can equip students with effective storytelling uh, skills and knowing how to um, make their story resonate with policymakers, um, that can often bend the curve uh, toward a more effective and uh, responsive policy for today's students. Yeah, and really quickly, the last thing I would add is um, for folks who are tuning in who may be college leaders or practitioners or faculty and staff, just want to encourage all of them to ensure that they're incorporating student voices in any sort of working groups or task forces that they're putting together to manage this coronavirus pandemic crisis happening in their community or on their campus, um, because it's important to hear how all of the current environment is impacting and affecting students there. So if student voices aren't already included in any sort of internal institutional discussions that you're having, um, definitely encourage you to do, do that. Looks like we have another question. Um, with talking about how this pandemic is going to change the way higher ed functions, do you think grading policies should be changing as well, such as using pass-fail options? Yeah, my response to this um, is largely connected to sort of the adjustments and the policy changes that JFF wants to see at large in terms of updates to the Higher Education Act, for example. So we don't believe that um, all students thrive and should attend the traditional semester-based courses that are often offered on college campuses. We think um, there needs to be more innovative, flexible, and accelerated models within higher education. I think this has implications for grading. So how can higher institutions think about incorporating credit for prior learning? Or how can they implement uh, competency-based education where students are able to progress along a pathway and in courses at their own speed as they develop and gain competencies in their area of study? Um, so that's it's related to grading and that it's it's thinking about student success in a different way and not so much about how long a student is in a classroom and how long they're sitting in class listening to instruction, but it's really measuring what they're learning, the competencies that they're developing um, in a new and innovative way. So in the long run, those are the sorts of updates to, to policy um, in, in higher education that we would like to see um, in the long term moving forward. Tyler, Emily, did you want to talk about that? Um, I, I would just um, note appreciation for, for Erica's comments about um, thinking in new and innovative ways. I'm also conscious of um, the realities of academic freedom and the ways that faculty um, will guard their rights to uh, determine how to, to grade courses. So um, I'll, I'll confess that the kind of pass-fail option is, is not something that we necessarily have engaged on deeply, so I wouldn't want to um, comment uh, out of school there. Um, but I, I would echo Erica's comments about taking a deep breath and, and to my comments from earlier, how do we think from top to bottom about um, the way this system is functioning and facilitating student success I think that's certainly part of the conversation, um, but I, I wouldn't feel comfortable weighing in uh, directly one way or another on that question. Okay, um, and I do have another question too while we wait and see if anyone else wants to pop in with one. Um, you know, when this is all over to some extent, we can leave our houses. Um, do you, what do you think that institutions or policymakers should be putting into place to prepare 
um, institutions and students for this happening again in the future because I have talked with some people who said you know this is going to happen again eventually so what do you think what policies should be put in place to protect more vulnerable students in the future should they have something like this happen again yeah I don't have a perfect answer but I do know um, you know institutions have teach out plans um, I wonder if there could be some updated version of a teach out plan where it's a go to virtual plan, something like that. Tyler, Erica, did you want to speak to that? I think it's a really tough question because, um, I mean, yeah, we talk about lots of content delivery um, mechanisms um, that that doesn't change the fact that some people have gotten sick. Um, so it, it's really tough to imagine in a, a really interconnected uh, world um, with a lot of students, you know, traveling over the world and, and coming back all over the world, um, what that what that would look like. So I'm not a public health expert, um, and I'm not I'm not sure about pandemic preparation, um, but I, I do hope that. On the back side of this, we, we do have a chance to take some lessons learned. I would say that for now, um, we I won't name any names, but it's instructive to see if there's a campus that brings students back onto campus in the flying in the face of the best uh, science and medical advice, that's not good for anyone and that's not good for our students and puts them at risk. So I think uh, looking at what not to do is the very first step uh, right now and thinking how we can better plan for the future. Yes, I would just add, of course, thinking more about investments in technology and how to best utilize technology for education. I think we also also should think about how can technology be used for training as well, um, for training for jobs. Can there be simulations that occur that students and, and workers can do online or remotely from a distance? I know it is very difficult when we think about certain programs of higher education where there is that element of hands-on and, and needing to be in person with folks, but um, thinking creatively about the, the other programs where that's not a requirement, um, how can we address those for if this were to happen again? Um, we have a couple more questions. One, um, it's probably a pretty quick answer. How would pass-fail affect prerequisites or applications for graduate schools when the GPA is needed? Um, so from my understanding, I think it's that's something schools are considering when they're deciding whether to go to pass-fail because it would affect it. Um, do you guys have any more insight on that? Yeah, I, I just heard something about this yesterday. Um, where uh, some students, I think, I believe it was in Texas, were um, contacting their institutions about um, the ability just to have a, a sort of a, an annotated transcript or to put on there that they were affected by um, this outbreak and it, it forced a course closure just to have a line on there and inquiring about how to systematize um, that. So we'll, we'll see how that goes, but I think that that's at the very base level something that we could think about um, doing is just for on your transcript you know noting the reality of where we were at this time in history yeah um and how do you predict this pandemic will affect um the incoming freshman classes in regards to orientation and getting them involved on campus anyone want to take that first i will i'm historically um a pessimist and skeptical so maybe this will be worst case scenario but um i i wonder if um the whole system might have to be rethought at this point um i live in virginia we're under stay at home until june 10th um, that's obviously 10 weeks away um, and past that seems pretty uncertain at this point too um i think for policymakers and institutions being able to prioritize um what students need at this time, kind of thinking about critical support um, and getting them set up for success um, versus, you know, some things that might have to fall by the wayside for this semester and this time. Uh, 
I, I'm generally um, somewhere on the border between pessimist and optimist, uh, but uh, I think Emily's largely uh, largely right here. Um, I think that you know, the uncertainty of of the fall is is creeping up on us real fast, even as we continue to navigate the uncertainty of the day to day. Um, I was talking with, with a former classmate uh, the other day. I was, you know, I went to school in the in the SEC and the Big Ten, and I was like, "Is there a situation where we put 90,000 or 100,000 people all together on Saturday afternoon um, by late August?" Um, maybe, uh, and obviously, a, a football game should be the least thing on our on our minds right now. But that it, it leads to a larger question about, you know, let's say, we're able to to safely congregate in groups of 40, but not 50. How do you do uh, an honor code signing ceremony? How do you do a host of things that are part of the traditional model of bringing folks um, onto campus? You know, I think that we're gonna know that until a ways down the line. But what we do know is that we've got a real and present danger in front of us. So I think the most important thing for now is to move through that and to, to trust in the expertise and knowledge and dedication to students that's particularly um, a feature of NASPA, and so when I've been in NASPA conferences in the back in the past, it's it's always invigorating to to be in that community. I'm um, relying on the professional principles of the association, um, and when you put the student interest at the center of your considerations for policy, you find that you come out with um, I think the the best determination in the end. So um, whenever we have that opportunity, um, putting the student experience first and then letting that lead us, I think, is always the way to go. Do you want to add to that, Erica? Yeah, the only other thing I would add is if we are in the same position um, come fall, I will say that technology can serve as a tool as well to connect folks. Um, I know at JFF, we're an organization of about 150, 160 individuals. So we're trying to be creative in terms of still touching base regularly with our coworkers. Um, there's like a parent group that meets regularly where they can bring their kids onto the camera and they can chat and have fun. I know there's another group that um, meets for like a pet sort of interaction and meet and greet. So I think those sorts of things would pop up and occur across campuses as well as how can they still get to know each other, be connected, maybe join affinity groups if they're not able to go back on campus. Um, I think the, the overall question is ensuring that all students have access to technology so that they can all be involved in those sorts of opportunities. I might add um, just one more thing. I think, yeah. um, that there, there, may, there will also be a lot of educational and community building opportunities that uh, come from this. And if there is any, silver lining at all to be drawn i think a sense of our our common humanity and all in this togetherness are put into very stark relief now in a way that the other generation more recent generations um, i think may not have uh, quite been a challenge with so i think if you think about bringing people on a campus and to um, talk about the the breakdown of the ways that we tend to wall ourselves off from people when we've all been really walled off from everyone that can also open uh, i think some new relationships and new learning uh, across the populations. Um, oh, I mean, imagine like you had two kids at home, you know, while you were going through the quarantine, like what was that like? And you're also enrolled in school. Like I think it may have populations be seen in a way that they may have been hidden more in the past. That's a good point. Um, well, we have just a few minutes left, um, so I guess is, are there any other, you know, final top level comments that any of you would want to make about um, student success for non-traditional or today's students and, you know, how that might intertwine with the pandemic? Sure. Um, just first, thank you so much for um, tuning in and for creating the space to have this conversation. Um, for those looking to learn more about the Today's Students Coalition, it's todaysstudentscoalition.org. Um, you can find all of the current members, our policy principles, and some of the things we've done to date. Um, and Erica, if I can be invited to that pet happy hour, let me know. 
Yes, definitely. We'll include you. It's I don't have pets myself, but it's nice to see cats and dogs and even little kids um, at home with, with my coworkers. But yeah, echoing what Emily said, please check out the Today's Students Coalition online to learn more about what we do and, and see how you can get involved. Um, besides that, would just say, you know, there's a lot of learning yet to occur in terms of how this coronavirus pandemic is going to impact today's students. So we're trying to stay in tune um, and to hear really what's happening in communities. That way we can turn around and go back to policymakers to advocate for updates that are needed. So we're looking to stay up to date and um, would love to hear from you all. And I'll just say thanks for the opportunity as well. Um, and as much as I wish that I was when I was in Austin with all of you, uh, I'm grateful for NASPA for making the right decision and how we uh, bring these conversations together this year. And hopefully we can all be together uh, a year from now. Um, we'll know a lot more uh, by the time NASPA uh, comes around uh, March of 2021. Um, but in the meantime, the most important thing I just mentioned earlier is just to continue to put our students' interests first. Um, that's both on our campuses and also in our, our policy advocacy. Um, and I'll just, just say that we occupy, some, I think, really privileged positions here um, in D.C. in terms of how we can do this advocacy work and, and spend a lot of time thinking about it um, week to week. But I think the most effective advocates are constituents. So I would just encourage people to continue to um, reach out to your legislators, tell them what you need if you're a student share your experience, share your voice, talk about what the needs of your students are on your campus, talk about the value of your institution to the community, to the economy, to the people that are surrounding you. Those are the things that I think will drive um, a policymaker, legislator in a, even a more profound way than you know, hearing a bunch of wonks coming at them uh, from week to week and, and all the time. So that's really important. And today is Census Day. So fill out your census, and if we can all be counted, hopefully we can be better represented and um, have a better working democracy down the line. So thank you all again. Yeah, thank you to our panelists, and thank you to NASPA, and thank you to everyone who attended this and watched. One more thank you to uh, today's panel. <laughs> Uh, an engaging, insightful conversation. And thank you to all of you who took the time to join us today. Um, as a reminder, we did record this session. You will be receiving an email in the next couple of days with the link. Hope you all be, be safe, be well, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch.